So welcome everyone. My name is Haley Buckner. I'm a registered dental hygienist and a preventive care consultant for Elevate Oral Care. Our speaker today is Dr. Matthew Allen. Our team of preventive care consultants have had the honor of listening to and interacting with Dr. Allen at our last two Elevate Oral Care National Education Meetings. Additionally, I attended Dr. Allen's two-day course in his beautiful state of Colorado and was able to do a deeper dive into this exciting topic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to our speaker, Dr. Matthew Allen. Dr. Allen is the president of M. David M.I. Incorporated, and he is the only U.S.-based dentist member of Mint, the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. He has helped champion and teach motivational interviewing, shared decision-making, and person-centered care in wide-ranging settings from national oral health collaboratives to academic institutions to private practice offices. Previously, Dr. Allen was the Clinic Dental Director at Clinica Family Health, a nationally recognized, federally qualified community health center serving the Denver metropolitan area, where he remains active in clinical practice. He also serves as part-time volunteer faculty at the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine. So Dr. Allen, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Haley, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm going to turn off my webcam here in a minute and switch over to the slides, but I feel like one of the things that I'm always thinking about is how do we make these interactive and, and help people uh, connect, uh, and I think sometimes seeing a face can be helpful in that, so it really is a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, hello, and, and thank you so much for joining us. So I'm gonna stop sharing my webcam and switch over to some slides. Maybe we'll come back at the end uh, for some questions. So let me do that real quick here. All right. So, uh, you know, again, I just, I just want to thank everyone um, for joining us. I know that there are lots of other things you could be doing, even in a time when we all have less to do potentially, um, or maybe a lot more to do, you still always have a choice with how you use your time. So thank you for choosing to be here with us today. And I mean, I think it's obvious that this is a really crazy time. Um, maybe many of us are feeling discombobulated and our routines have been thrown. Um, and hopefully today we can kind of come back to uh, a center place, um, something that reminds us of why we all got into healthcare, um, and, and, and really focus on the healing power of words and, and what that means and how we can apply this understanding even when we can't see our patients face to face, uh, so that we can continue to help them uh, stay healthy even during this time. So. Like Haley said, we just want to make sure you know who both of us are. Uh, Haley kind of mentioned uh, who I am and, and where I work, and, and she also mentioned that she is a preventative care consultant from Elevate Oral Care. In the, uh, as we send out the objectives, uh, you, you know, here they are. If you'd like to read, great. I will let you do that on the screen. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about each of these kind of three main areas today. I also know that, you know, when I see objectives, I don't remember those things, so I like to try to boil these down. And so what are the three objectives that we're really looking at today? And I would say, if we can understand how to approach our patients with a spirit of empathy, what does that mean? How can we do that? What might that sound like uh, in this current time? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about goal setting and again, what that might mean for our patients uh, even now. And then lastly, we'll talk about sharing information with our patients and what kind of information might be important for us to share with our patients as we continue to work with them in this current environment. And so we'll kind of apply each of these and, and Haley and I will get to have a conversation uh, where you might get to hear what that might sound like as one example of, of how we can apply each of these three different pieces to our objectives. So before we kind of really get started, uh, I would like to invite us all into just a place of, of breathing and, and uh, reflection. Uh, I was reading the other day, C.S. Lewis in 1948 wrote this uh, short little essay called On Living in an Atomic Age, uh, right after the close of World War II, and you know we, the world had just been kind of plunged into what does it look like to kind of live under the threat of the atomic bomb. And he wrote this beautiful little essay uh, that I would highly commend to all of you if you would like to read it. Uh, but essentially asking the questions, how are we supposed to live in an atomic age? 
And I think it has a lot of applicability to our current crisis. Um, and at the end of the first little section, he says this, uh, he says, they may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, very prescient, right? Um, but they need not dominate our minds. And so what I would like to invite us all into is a practice uh, of, of silence and just gratitude just for a minute so that we can all uh, kind of center ourselves. We know that practicing gratitude is one of the best ways to reduce anxiety. And so if this is something you're practicing every day, great. Uh, I think it can be really helpful in this time and always. Um, if not, uh, then you get a chance to practice it right now. So one of the things, um, this, these are my kids, and that's why this picture is up here for me. So I'm incredibly grateful for them. I would just encourage you to think about one or two things maybe that you're grateful for uh, you know, today. And we'll take a minute, we'll take some breaths, and in a minute we'll come back together. I would encourage you, you know, if you think of one or two things, maybe to share those things with your family at the dinner table tonight, uh, with your friends, whoever, you know, text your friends, tell them you're grateful for them if you're thinking about them, whatever it might be. So let's just all take a minute. I'm going to be quiet and, and we can uh, take a couple deep breaths and, and remember what we're grateful for in this time. All right, great job. If you're anything like me, that's just, once, once you start that many, you're like, oh man, I want five more of those. So uh, I hope you find some time to, to practice some silence and some gratitude um, as, as we all experience our current world. So I wanna start off kind of by uh, understanding what our, what our role is as dental professionals. And up until a couple of weeks ago, you were probably all pretty sure uh, of what your role was, whether that's just in your office or in your profession, you, you were pretty sure. And then, you know, less than 10 days ago, you get this email, right? You're like, okay, well, now all the things that I've been doing or most of the things I've been doing every day are, are changing. You get this email from the ADA or you log on to the ADHA website and you see this information. I mean, our whole world has been thrown upside down in just a couple of weeks. And you know, we've all seen the recommendations from the CDC and from our state licensing boards and from our state dental associations. Everyone has put forth guidance on this, which you know, really quickly, and we're so I'm so grateful for, for the many people that are out there working really hard to, to make sure that we've been taken care of so that we can take care of our patients correctly in this time. But kind of given this new upside down world, what I've heard some dental professionals say, who again, a couple of weeks ago, were so sure of their role is, you know, so elective procedures, all this is gone, like what can I do? You know, emergency only, like, so maybe that's okay for dentists, but like, what about hygienists? And I think it's caused a lot of us to kind of re-examine our roles to say, how do I support, you know, both the general healthcare team in this time and, and to continue to support my patients, what can I do? Uh, and so, you know, in some places that's allowed people to integrate into a larger healthcare team. So people at, who are at community health centers might be helping out the medical team. Um, I saw, you know, uh, Governor Cuomo in New York today talking about, you know, kind of drawing in this whole kind of volunteer healthcare force that's helping. There are a lot of opportunities for that, which is so, so great. And that's, we're very excited about that. But that's also not an option for everyone. And so I think kind of getting back to the question of, of examining our role, I think it really gets back to this question. Uh, you know, as, as dental professionals, in some ways we are primary care providers and in some ways we are surgical subspecialists. Uh, so whether you're a dentist or a hygienist, uh, you know, a lot of what our day might look like is on the right side of the screen here. And we're thinking about, uh, you know, 
more surgical type of procedures. We have a handpiece in our hand, we have a, you know, a ultrasonic in our hand, and we might spend a little bit less time thinking about the left side of the screen and how we act as primary care providers. And I think that this time has, has reoriented some of us to say, I do have this really important role over here and I can really make an impact with my patients on the left hand side of the screen here making, uh, you know, being a, being a primary care provider and helping my patients manage chronic disease, which is what we do uh, in oral health. I think another one of the kind of big uh, changes that this, that our circumstances have brought us into in this time is, you know, how do we use our senses in our job every day? And so traditionally, you know, that's the left-hand side of the screen here. We're, we're looking at visual, tactile, you know, we're using our eyes, we're feeling things, our, we're using our explorer, right? We're doing all of these things to determine, you know, carries or whatever that might be. And we're, we're, we're really familiar with that. And I think that this, this time in this crisis has kind of called us in to say, I have to use my ears a lot more and I have to use my, my auditory abilities to be able to understand and listen to people in ways that I might not have before because my, my one sense is, is now decreased. And I think for some of us, that's you know kind of brought, it's opened our metaphorical eyes, so to speak, that we might have some gaps on the right side of the screen. What does it look like to listen really well? What does it look like to help our patients understand that we hear them, uh, that we're with them and know them? And so, that's totally okay if we have that realization. There's absolutely no shame in that. Um, and we want to talk though a little bit today about how we might start to fill that gap. If we have been focusing on the left-hand side here, if we have been focusing more as our, on our role as surgical subspecialists, how can we use our ears and listen a little bit more? And then with uh, Dr. McLean and Dr. Horst in the future to talk a little bit more how we can you know, apply uh, some more of the kind of uh, primary care principles to chronic disease management uh, and less less on that kind of how do we do surgery all the time. So th that's our hope for at least these first couple of, of webinars, and, and I hope that you uh, walk away feeling with uh, feeling that you've gotten a lot from these, and uh, maybe had again had our eyes metaphorically open. So that's our role. Uh, then let's think a little bit about our patients in this time as well. And to do that, I want to talk about two different studies. Um, and so the first study that I want to talk about uh, came out a couple of years ago in the Journal of uh, Clinical and Translational Research um, and done by mostly some, some research out of the researchers out of the University of Colorado. And what they looked at um, was a group of patients on the Pine Ridge Reservation in Ogallala County, uh, Ogallala, Lakota County, South Dakota, uh, where the Ogallala Sioux live, Ogallala Sioux. And this is the poorest county in the country per capita income. There are 3,143 counties in the country and they're number 3,143 in terms of per capita income. And I've actually got to work up in South Dakota uh, with some of the people who work on the Pine Ridge Reservation and, and got to talk to them and understand some of the challenges that, that go on up there. And what the study looked at was, okay, so we want to provide some enhanced community services uh, for oral health. Um, and so some literacy efforts, they put up billboards, they sent out brochures, um, talking about early childhood caries, and then they, they gave away um, and kind of provided some, some dental, you know, materials and goods like toothbrushes and toothpaste. And then they also did that with or without motivational interviewing. So if this is your first time hearing that term, uh, we'll talk a little bit about mo more about what that means in just a second. Um, but what they found was essentially uh, there was no difference between the two groups. So, uh, you know, enhanced uh, community services without MI was about the same as with MI. And so how, how we were talking to patients wasn't really making a difference for these patients. And I've had the, you know, opportunity to speak with some of the researchers and, and have coffee with them on this trial. And, and what they found essentially was that social factors here had a huge impact. Um, and if we're kind of going back and thinking about maybe uh, our undergraduate psychology classes and, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When people are you know, really forced to kind of meet some of those basic needs, physiological needs, safety needs, it's a lot harder to kind of build that pyramid and focus on the top parts of it, like self-fulfillment and self-actualization. Uh, I also talked you know, to, to one of the researchers who said the closest grocery store for a lot of these people was a gas station that was a half an hour away that had no healthy foods. 
So even if you wanted to eat healthy, it really wasn't an option. And so these social factors had a huge impact on whether or not how we talk to patients could actually help them stay healthy. So that's just one study, um, and we'll come back to how this relates, I think, to our current crisis in a little bit. The second study that I would like to highlight here just came out this year in the Journal of Dental Research, uh, and this is done by some researchers in the United Kingdom. I was actually fortunate enough to, to be over in the UK actually earlier this month, which feels like a lifetime ago. It was right before everything kind of went crazy. And uh, what they looked at was five to seven-year-old patients who were scheduled for at least one extraction of a primary tooth. And what they did is they had their dental nurses, which are essentially like our dental assistants, have one 30-minute conversation uh, with, a, with the parent of the patient, just one 30-minute conversation before the, the extraction appointment, um, kind of based in the style and skills of motivational interviewing. And then they referred him back to their general dentist. Two years later, they came back around and they checked and said, did that make a difference in terms of who has carried or not? So one group skips that 30 minute conversation, one group doesn't. And two years later, um, what they found was a relative risk reduction of 29% for new carious lesions in the kids who had had that one 30 minute conversation with the dental nurse. Now with the dentist, now with the dental hygienist, this was with a dental assistant, which I think is fascinating. and really wonderful as we think about how we apply team-based care in our settings. And, you know, this was, like, that conversation that I got to have with the researchers and one of the dental nurses when I was over in the UK was really interesting because for, for them, it felt really paradigm shifting as practitioners. Um, you know, they had a lot going on. They had, you know, these big changes, but simply by talking to patients differently, they, they felt like there was a difference. Um, and I think that they probably could have predicted the outcome it felt like even of this study uh, based on how they were able to have those conversations with patients. And so just by talking to people differently, they saw reduced numbers of caries, which again, I think is, is really fascinating as we think about how our words matter to our patients. So kind of thinking about those two trials, um, I kind of want to present a revolutionary idea, you know, as we think about our role, um, both in this crisis and, and after it's over. And then, you know, kind of given what we know about our patients based on those two studies, maybe. And, you know, as I say revolutionary here, I don't mean revolutionary as like the next biggest thing to come. I mean, revolutionary is like 1876 revolutionary and Alexander Graham Bell and just picking up the telephone. Um, what could we do during this time that would allow our patients to stay healthy? And I think one of the big things is having conversations with our patients and being able to talk to them in this time. Uh, we don't have to have a handpiece to pick up the phone and check in with our patients. And we'll talk about what that might look like and how that might feel. And for some of you who might be on the line who are dental case managers or who are already in this role, who are calling patients, who are checking in on them, maybe this idea isn't so revolutionary to you. Uh, but for a number of the other, a number of the rest of us, this might be really different as we think about, okay, all of the rest of my tools have been taken away potentially. Here's what I can, can do. And so I, I want to present, you know, the, the idea of one more study as why we think this might be effective. So a couple of years ago in this Journal of Special Care Dentistry in 2013, they did a study on kind of dental case manager encounters and did it matter if we called people and what happened was the more that you know people got called, these were the three characteristics. They were more likely to finish their phase one treatment plan, they were more likely to be retained in their dental care, and they were more likely to experience improvements in their overall healthcare status. So we probably won't find a lot more people finishing phase one treatment right now because they can't really come in to finish their phase one treatment. But we do know, um, wouldn't it be great if hey, our patients did come back to us when all this was over, and wouldn't it be great if they actually stayed healthier and improved their oral care even as uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have the ability to interact with them face to face. So if this is our revolutionary idea, then let's apply this kind of revolutionary idea of the telephone or you know, what, what is currently understood as teledentistry to our current crisis, what skills can help uh, in this short, how, how can we develop those skills in a short period of time? So I don't want to present the huge whole framework of, you know, what motivational interviewing is in terms of everything. I want to try to give you guys uh, a few skills that you might be able to apply uh, on the phone or via, you know, webcam, Zoom or something like that 
in this time that might help us uh, improve uh, the oral health of our patients at home. So let's go back. So first we talked about the, uh, in terms of what we might want from this time as a, developing a spirit of empathy and really understanding our patients and having their best interests in mind. And so we've seen this term a couple of times already, motivational interviewing, what is it? Uh, and so for those of you who like definitions, here's a definition, person-centered, guiding, uh, we wanna try to highlight this and strengthen motivation for change in our patients. So essentially it's about helping people change. Uh, if you look at the textbook on this, uh, the subtitle is helping people change. Uh, for those of you who may not be a definition person, to me this sticks a little bit better. I'm, I'm more of an anecdote person or an analogy person, a metaphor person. I think in dentistry historically, we've been really good about asking this kind of question to our patients. So, you know, what is the matter with you? And we don't ask it like that, and certainly not in that condescending way, like I might have just said, but we might say, hey, what is your chief complaint? Or, you know, why are you here today? And, and really, that's designed for us to get the answer to what can we fix? What can we address for this person? And that is really important. We should address that. That is really important for us to do. I don't want you to walk away uh, from this talk saying, hey, Dr. Allen said it wasn't important that we you know, address our patient's chief complaint. Absolutely not. Um, but I think that there's a better way that we can ask this question that gets it, gets it what might be important to our patients uh, a little bit differently. So instead of asking what is the matter with you, what if we ask this question? What is the matter, I'm sorry, what matters to you? Uh, what matters to you? Because I think if we ask this question, we will get the answer to that first question. We will hear what our patient's chief complaint is, and we will probably also hear a little bit more uh, about our patient's values, about our patient's preferences, how they desire to actually um, get to that place of health and you know, solving, solving the issues that they might have. And so if this resonates with you, great. Um, if this is all you learned from today, to say, hey, maybe we can ask more of this latter type of question instead of the former, that's awesome. I think that this can make a really, really big difference for our patients. And so kind of going back, based on this question, let's apply kind of our learning from the first study that we looked at from the Pine Ridge Reservation kind of to our current public health crisis. And, you know, I think for many people right now, they're a really concerned with a lot of other things, probably besides their oral health right now. Maybe they lost their job. Uh, maybe, you know, their elderly relative is really sick. Uh, you know, if you're a basketball fan, I saw Carl Anthony Towns today. His grandmother had, you know, symptoms. Now she's in a medically induced coma. I think his mom maybe. So, you know, people have these big concerns. Maybe they're, maybe it's just their kids are at home all day now and they've never been used to that and they're driving them batty. Uh, you know, people have different concerns right now than they might have normally had before all of this started. And I think if we ask this question to our patients, uh, we're going to at least figure out what their top priorities are. And if that's not oral health right now, that is totally okay. And we need to respect that, um, you know, always, but, but especially in this time when we know people have a lot going on. I also want to present this idea to you that, you know, in motivational interviewing, there's this kind of spirit that undergirds it. So these kind of characteristics of who we are uh, and how we communicate with our patients that actually do have a big impact, um, both on our relationship and their experience of care, and also the outcomes that they might actually have. And so the way I tend to remember this is CAPE, so C-A-P-E. Uh, we want to treat our patients with compassion. We want to respect their autonomy to choose what's best for them. Uh, we want to partner with them. We don't want to work on or to people. We want to work with them, not even for them. We want to work with them. That's a, that's a big shift, I think. And then lastly, we want to hear from them and that idea of evoking and, and hearing their voice uh, much more maybe than our own. And so I think if we combine this with that previous question, we can really start to approach our patients to say, hey, we're here to walk alongside you, to help you. Um, if this isn't something that, you know, is, is super important to you right now, uh, whether that's right now in this crisis or in the future, that's okay. We are here for you. We are ready. We want the best for you. We want to hear from you. We want to walk with you. Uh, so how can we kind of apply these two ideas to what it might sound like to use some teledentistry, uh, telephone, video conferencing, whatever, to actually talk with our patients. And so I'm, I'm excited that Haley has agreed to, to have a conversation with me. Uh, and what we're going to do is just kind of do a short little role play that might help us understand what this conversation sounds like. And so 
what what is it what you know we want to give you an example if we decided to call our patients uh right now who can't come in uh, as we try to help them stay healthy in this time and again kind of approach them with their best interests in mind so Haley, does that sound okay to you that sounds great okay cool so it's going to feel a little bit weird uh, everyone we're going to kind of you know be a little bit kitschy we're going to do the ring ring and we're going to uh, kind of build off of this conversation as we go so sound good Haley? That works for me. All right, cool. So, ring, 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 ring. Hello. Hi, uh, is Haley there? This is her. Hi, Haley. This is uh, Dr. Allen from Neighborhood Family Dental. Uh, how are you doing today? Oh, hey, Dr. Allen. I'm doing good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. You know, it's uh, it's obviously a crazy time, but you know, I'm managing. So, how about you? You hanging in there? Yeah, hanging in there. Yeah. Uh, kids are home from school, obviously. I'm working from home, so a little busy and stressed, but hanging in there. Cool. Well, it sounds like you're you're doing about as well as can be hoped in this time. So that sounds good. Um, well, I'm you know I don't want to take up too much of your time, as I know it sounds like you're busy, but I'm calling just because I noticed that you had an exam um, scheduled with us coming up next month, and kind of given the current coronavirus situation, you know, it looks like we might not be able to make that happen based on, you know, kind of public health interests and our state recommendations and national recommendations. And so, you know, in spite of all that, I wonder if you might be willing to, you know, if you have a few minutes today, maybe we could chat and just to see how we can support and partner with you, uh, even during this crazy time, just to help keep your mouth healthy until you're able to come back and see us again in person. How does that sound to you? Yeah, that sounds good. I've got a couple minutes. Okay, great. Cool. So that might be, you know, it that we, we say, hey, we, you know, we'd like to talk with you. Can we? Can, do we have permission? Uh, we're asking permission there. And, and Haley in this situation says, yeah, that sounds great. I've got a couple of minutes to chat with you and, and we'll continue this conversation in a minute. One of the things that we wanted to do is, you know, one of the questions that it seems like, you know, we, we might get is, well, what if someone says no? So let's just roll that back real quick and maybe we can see what it might look like to respect the autonomy of someone in this situation to say, no, I don't want to do that and how we can still let them know that we can be here for them uh, if they want in the future. So, Haley, does that sound good to you too? Can we roll it back real quick? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So, uh, ring, ring, ring. Hello. Hi, is Haley there? This is her. Hi, Haley, this is Dr. Allen from Neighborhood Family Dental. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm good, thanks, Dr. Allen. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit crazy times out there. Are you are you managing? How, how are things going for you at home? Busy. I've got so much going on with work and kids. I'm just very busy. Okay. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time then. I, I'm, I'm just calling because I noticed you had an exam scheduled for us uh, with us next month. And, you know, given the current situation, it sounds like we might not be able to make that happen based on some public health recommendations and, and recommendations from our national association. So, I wonder if you just have a few minutes to chat today so that we could kind of figure out, you know, how we can support and partner with you even during this crazy time to, to help keep your mouth healthy until you're able to come in and see us again. You know, today's actually really not a good time. I've got the kids running around like crazy. It's just it's not a good time today. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's totally, yeah. So it sounds like you're really busy right now. Um, you know, if there's a better time, we're happy to call you back. Or, you know, if you feel relatively comfortable, you know, with how things are going, we're happy just to kind of reach out to you once this is all over and see what, what would you prefer? Would you like me to, you know, give you a call back at a different time? Or, you know, do you feel okay with, with where you're at uh, until you're able to come back and see us? Um, yeah, I think I'm okay until I can, am able to come back in and see you guys. Okay. Well, you know, we're here for you. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Someone, someone will be here to chat with you and, and we can make sure that uh, if you do have any questions or needs in this time, we are definitely able to, to be here for you. So thanks a lot. I, uh, I hope you, uh, you know, go be with those kids and, and we look forward to seeing you back uh, whenever, whenever this is all over. Thanks, Dr. Allen. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Have a good day. You too. So even situation hopefully our patient feels like wow someone's willing to call someone's willing to reach out to me they're not being overly pushy we're not trying to sell them anything we're not trying we're just here for them we're letting them know hey we care about you enough to call you to notice that you had an appointment next month uh, and to proactively reach out to you to potentially help you stay healthy in this time and if now is not a good time for them that's okay too uh, so as we think about you know where our patients are currently at hopefully that's helpful for us as we think about 
you know, maybe this proactive approach, not just the kind of emergency, uh, what might it be if our patients are calling us currently in pain, but what might it look like to proactively reach out to our patients? The second thing that I want to talk a little bit about is this idea of goal setting. And the idea here, um, it, it, the kind of main idea is this idea of SMGs. And so for those of you who might not be familiar with this term, it stands for self-management goal. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about what that is and then how we might apply that to where we're at. So a self-management goal, by definition, if we look at the definition, right, self-management goal is patient-driven. This is not something where we look at a patient and say, hey, look, like here are your really big gaps, you need to work on those areas. This is something where we say to a patient, what do you think you can do? What is important to you in terms of keeping your teeth healthy? It's not someone else's management goal, it's a self-management goal. And what kind of questions might, might we be able to ask a patient that might engage them in the process of choosing what is important to them? We'll talk about that in just a second. One of the second characteristics that we see about self-management goals that is important is that they're smart. So the idea of you know, them being specific and measurable and achievable, uh, relevant or realistic, depends on you know, how you wanna define that R, uh, time bound. So does it have to be all of these things? Of course not. But if a patient just says to us, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to keep my teeth healthy, that's my goal. That's awesome, right? Like that, that's, a, that's a really good North Star for us to work towards, but there's probably gonna be some specific behaviors that we can help guide a patient to, to actually help them do this. Um, as we think about maybe having this conversation with a patient, one of the questions that I can see being really effective in terms of helping a patient talk about what these kind of behaviors might be is something like this. So when you think about the next time you're able to come in and see us next, like what goals do you have that might help you keep your teeth healthy? you know, in the meantime, and make this your own, but try to help, you know, uh, craft the question so that we're really asking the patient to be involved in this process. We know that when a patient is involved in choosing the goal, they're much more likely to achieve it. If you remember back to the dental recur trial that I just talked a little bit about uh, with the kids in the UK, the primary researcher for that trial said this, she said, this trial is important because we found if we change how we talk to parents about prevention, their child, their, chi their children go on to develop many fewer cavities. The key is helping parents choose one or two behaviors they feel they can change for their child rather than us telling parents what to do. That makes the difference. Wow, that's a really profound uh, way of thinking about this. In the office, one of the things that we found that is effective in terms of helping patients set goals is using what we call a self-management goal menu. So you can see one here on the screen. What it looks like is generally uh, some different options that a patient can say, hey, this might be important to me, or I think I wanna work on this, or oh, this seems like how I can help keep my teeth healthy. You know, on this self-management goal menu, there are many if you search these on the internet. Um, there's different ones for different age groups and different populations. On this one, there's some in-office strategies, right? Those might be gone for us right now, but there still are some at-home strategies here. And if we were going to call our patient, um, you know, maybe we could have this around so that we, if our patient's like, I don't know what I could do to keep my teeth healthy. We have a few things that we could say, well, these couple things could keep you healthy. I wonder if any of those resonate with you. Or if you do have the ability to email your patients, perhaps you could email all of them and say, hey, we wanna help continue to support you. Here are some things you could do at home, you know, to help keep your teeth healthy. We're gonna to try to call all of you and check in, see what might be important to each of you, and we can, we can document that in your chart and follow up with you when you come back. So I think that there are ways that we can proactively do this kind of work um, so that our patients are, are likely to be successful and are likely to choose goals that matter to them. So let's go back and kind of go back into the conversation that Haley and I are having. We'll pick up kind of from where we left off, but what might this sound like if Haley and I were having a conversation about this and kind of helping her pick a goal that she feels like she might want to work on currently. So Haley, does that sound okay with you? Are you ready to go again? I'm ready. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, Haley, I'm, I'm really glad that we have a few minutes to chat today. Uh, I think the first question that I have for you, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, is just, you know, how do you feel like things are going for you currently at home um, in terms of, you know, you know, what are you doing to help yourself maintain oral health in this time? And how's that going for you? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm usually pretty good about 
rushing, you know, morning and night, but I got to be honest with you, I've been so busy and tired that by the time nighttime rolls around, I get into bed and kind of forget that night rushing often. So probably taking a little backseat to, you know, uh, my kids and work and everything that's been keeping me busy right now. Yeah, you've had a, a lot going on, it sounds like. Yeah. And, and that's kind of prevented you from, you know, maybe keeping the normal habits. It sounds like in the past you were, you were doing a pretty good job of brushing twice a day, but right now that's, that's kind of been slipping a little bit. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like that's something that you would like to continue. It, it sounds like it's something that you would like to do. I wonder, you know, it sounds like it's not happening every night. On the nights you've been successful, what's helped you actually continue to be successful in, in making sure that you brush at night? Yeah, you know, um, the other day I, I left my toothbrush out after I brushed in the morning, and it was right there at night when I walked by the bathroom, so I saw it, and then right then I was like, oh, yeah, I need to make sure I brush before I even think about getting in bed. So that definitely helped that night. Okay, so the visual cue. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So the visual cue could be something that, that could help you and, and kind of moving forward, if you know you were to kind of do that every night, you know, how do you feel like that might help you kind of achieve your goal? You feel like that might be successful? Or tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think something as simple as just leaving it out can make sure that I it's a good quick reminder before I jump into bed to make sure I've, you know, finished my routine and take better care of my teeth. Okay. Great. Um, cool. On a scale from zero to 10, where zero is not confident on, 10 is super confident. If you were to do that every night, how confident are you that you would kind of get back to brushing twice a day, do you think? If I were to do that, I'd, I'd be pretty confident, probably about an eight or so. Okay. So like an eight. Why like an eight and not a four? Um, you know, because I know it's really important and it's something that I really want to do is to take good care of my teeth, especially since I'm not able to see you guys right now. So it's something that I'm thinking about, so I think I'll be able to accomplish that. Cool. Well, you know, that's. It sounds like you're really confident. It sounds like you have a good plan for yourself. Um, we're happy to support you in that. We can chart it down here in your chart, and, and hopefully, you know, in a little bit when we're able to see you again, we'd love to check in with you. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. No problem. So, you know, that takes probably two minutes uh, for Haley and I to have that conversation. We certainly could add more in there in terms of could we do a caries risk assessment for our patients at home of course we could like we could ask more questions and we could do more um but if Haley has figured out you know yeah i mean i was even noticing myself the other night you know as we essentially homeschool our children for the first time ever and do some of these things where man i was getting into bed at night and it's like, let's just watch a show and then I, my, myself i was like wow i haven't brushed my teeth but yet i don't even want to get out of my bed right now to go do this so you know, a lot of our patients might be in that same boat. They might have other things, other habits that have changed or other things that are going on for them. How can we continue to support them, um, but, but really help them choose what is important to them in this time? So hopefully uh, in that two minute conversation, you can see one or two things that, that might be helpful for you in terms of calling your patients and, uh, or you know, video chatting with them or whatever that might look like to help keep them healthy in this current time. And lastly, the, the, third, the third thing we talked about at the beginning, kind of the third objective was this idea of sharing information. And, and there are definitely times when we need to share information with patients, especially maybe right now, uh, we might have some things that maybe we've never talked about with patients before. You know, never, we've never really said, oh wow, we need that, but maybe we do now. And so how do we do that in a way that's consistent with everything we've discussed so far so we don't go back to just the old, we're gonna tell you what to do. How do we share information with patients in an effective way. And so to do that, I'd like to present a simple framework that I think really allows us to do that. And the framework is pretty easy to remember. It's two words, one of the words is twice. Uh, so this is the, the framework is explore, offer, explore. If you're familiar at all with motivational interviewing uh, in the textbook, this is referred to as elicit, provide, elicit, which feels a little jargony to me. Some people call it ask, tell, ask. Uh, tell feels a little bit kind of finger waggy to me. That's not a word finger waggy, but you know what I'm talking about. So I like this idea of explore, offer, explore. One of my mentors kind of coined this and I feel like it's helpful because it feels like uh, we're simply offering and, and we're exploring with our patients. We're doing it together, it feels like to me. And so what do, what do each of these terms mean? So explore, uh, what does our patient know uh, about what kind of information we want to share with them? We offer, we share the information. This is not an opportunity for like a 45 minute diatribe. 
This is an opportunity for us to share a small kind of piece of information, the, the most salient points. And then lastly, the most, probably the most important part of this framework is to really invite our patients back into the conversation by asking what they think about the information we've shared. Uh, if we don't do this, the conversation can stall. And so what we wanna do is really invite the patient back in to say, hey, you know, I just shared some information with you. How does that resonate with you? What do you think? How does that feel? Um, so explore, what do they know? Offer, we share the information, what do they think? So given our current situation, what might be kind of two really important things for us to share with our patients? What might be two different conversation types? Well, I think one of them potentially could be a patient's calling in with an emergency, and we might need to share some information with them about what kind of treatment we can or can't do, um, whether they need to come in or not, depending on what's going on. And so simply saying, you know, what do you know about how, you know, our current kind of coronavirus uh, pandemic is impacting dental offices and they might, I don't know anything. Oh, okay, cool. Is it okay if I share a little bit, a bit of information with you? Uh, great. We share some information. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Oh yeah, that makes sense. Like, you know, yeah, I've got a little bit of kind of sensitivity in my gums, but it makes sense that I wouldn't need to come in right now. And I'll make sure I follow up, you know, when, when uh, this is all over, something like that. So that certainly is one opportunity where we might have to share information with patients. And so we could do it with this framework. Um, Haley and I would like to kind of do uh, one more little role play here before we finish up and just kind of share another scenario where I think that there are some things that we could do for our patients in this time uh, in terms of prevention. And so if we decide to call our patients, what information might we share with them to keep them healthy over the next two or three or six months or however, however long all of this lasts, right? Until we can see people in our offices again. So Haley, you, you good for one more role play? I'm ready. All right, well, we'll finish up that conversation then. So. Well, great, Haley. It sounds like, you know, uh, kind of keeping your toothbrush out is something that you really want to do and will help you kind of um, maintain your health in this time. I wonder, you know, we, we have some things that we can kind of, um, you know, share with you as well that might even help you a little bit more that are pretty simple. Um, and so I wonder if it would be okay if I shared a little bit of information with you about, about that um, in terms of how you can keep yourself as healthy as possible. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. For sure. Um, I have a question for you first in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll talk about fluoride and I just want to know, you know, what you know about how fluoride helps keep your teeth healthy. That's pretty much the extent of it is that I know it's good for my teeth and it keeps them healthy. <laughs> okay, so you're, you, you, you're looking for the fluoride toothpaste at the, at the supermarket, but you're not necessarily, necessarily sure exactly how it's working. That's right. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't need to share, you know, all that, you know, all the detail with you other than you know, fluoride really is the thing, um, the, the best thing that we have to keep to keep your teeth healthy. It really strengthens them. It can actually even take some of the kind of small, early spots where our teeth might be starting to develop cavities and it can actually reverse it. So it doesn't even need fillings. Um, and so we generally know that more fluoride is more effective at doing that. Um, but, you know, we have prescription toothpaste that have more to, uh, fluoride in it than the toothpaste that you might use at home. And so if you're interested during this time, you know, some people are in, you know, kind of shelter in place and might not be able to go out, but, but that's not our case right now. And so if you wanted, if you're going to the grocery store or whatever, you wanted to swing by the office, um, you know, we could have someone run out, just call us. You don't have to come in and touch anything, um, but we'd be happy to get you, you know, a prescription toothpaste uh, that has more fluoride than your typical toothpaste in it um, that you could use during this time. So how does that feel to you? So I would just, switch it out for the toothpaste, toothpaste I'm using right now? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, instead of the normal toothpaste, you would use this kind of special toothpaste. Um, and, you know, what we generally recommend is that you brush with it, you spit, and don't rinse. So, you know, don't, don't rinse it off. Um, you know, that allows the residue to stay on there and as you sleep to kind of really penetrate into your teeth um, and help keep them healthy. So, how, how does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Well, you know, we could, we could, we have some in our office. So if you, again, if you want to swing by, we'd be happy to get it to you. Just give us a call. We can, we can run it out to you or, you know, we could certainly call in a prescription as well. A lot of pharmacies have different kinds as well. So we'd be happy to, to do either. I wonder what works best for you. Yeah, I'll actually be running to the store later. So I'll swing by afterwards and pick it up for me guys. Okay, great. Well, we'll make sure we wipe it down first uh, as, as we give it to you and, and make sure, you know, it's as uh, 
as sanitary as possible as, as we give it to you. So, but that sounds great. We're, we're glad to help support you in that way. And, uh, you know, when you come back in a couple of months, uh, once again, once all this is over, we can see how that's going for you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, Haley, you know, I really want to just uh, thank you for, you know, participating in these role plays. Hopefully, you know, these are small examples. We didn't want it to take a lot of time. We don't want this to feel something uh, like it's something burdensome, but I do think we all have an opportunity to reach out to our patients in this time and, and really, um, you know, do these three things, respect their autonomy, let them know we care, we want to partner with them. Um, we want to, you know, approach them with that spirit of empathy. We do, we can help them set goals even in this time. And, and we can also share some information with them potentially that could be really beneficial. And maybe someone doesn't want a 5,000 part per million toothpaste, but maybe it's just brush, spit, and don't rinse. Um, that is better than, you know, rinsing it off right away. We know that. So uh, maybe that's the information we share and, and that's great. That can still help our patients stay healthy in this time. So what does this look like moving forward to kind of close here? Um, you know, we, we're kind of in a shadowy space right now. And, and what does the light look like on the other side of the door? Uh, you know, and so what is, I, I kind of keep watching myself say, well, what is it going to be like when things go back to normal? And I actually don't think things are going to go back to normal per se. I think we will find a new normal after this time. And I think that especially for something like teledentistry, this is a watershed moment. And we're gonna have to find ways to adapt. I think these skills will become increasingly as important um, as some of our visual and tactile uh, abilities might be taken away as we do more and more teledentistry consults potentially with our patients. Um, but I can also see a future where this is not only the right thing to do for our patients, because right now we might not be getting paid for it, but I could also see a future where these kinds of services are reimbursable and, you know, whether that's in the current fee for system or fee for service model, or as we transition to a different payment model, like value-based care or something like that, I think this will become increasingly important in us using these skills to help our patients stay healthy, using this talking intervention to help patients stay healthy will become increasingly important. But, you know, all that to say, the center of healthcare, I truly think, will always be human to human interaction. And if this time has taught us anything, is that we really need each other. Uh, and so I hope that the style and skills that we've discussed today help us to deepen that connection with our patients, whether or not that's on the phone, on a Zoom chat, or face to face. I hope you found one or two or three things that you can take forth in this time and feel like, man, my role is currently still important and I have something to do. Uh, to help keep my patients healthy, to help keep our nation healthy, uh, and to help us as dental professionals uh, continue to operate in the space um, that is important for us to operate in. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we want to take 10 minutes or so for questions. If, you, if this is something that's super interesting to you, like Haley mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, I do have a workshop in uh, the fall this year, uh, in September in Denver. You are more than welcome to come. We do have, we offer CE. Uh, you can go to uh, my website there and, and the workshops page on that to register if you're interested in spending two days really learning more about these skills. Happy to um, have you there. Uh, and we would love to support any of you in terms of learning more about what this might look like for your patients moving forward. So with that, uh, we will come and be ready for some questions. I'm gonna um, turn on my webcam again and, and we can, field any questions that people might have. All right, so a couple of questions have come in. The first one says, what if a patient says they never brush their teeth? How do you motivate them to begin this habit? Oof. How do we, if a patient says they never brush their teeth, how do we motivate them to begin? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that I tend to do before I ask any questions about habits, is I tend to ask patients about goals for their teeth, and that might be on their health history or some other place, but I feel like having a conversation about it is really important, especially with new patients. So for a new patient, I won't dive into any habit type of things until I say, tell me about your goals for your teeth, like long-term, big picture, what does that look like for you? And, you know, I've never had a patient say to me, I want teeth that hurt, that are black, that, you know, look bad. Most people are saying, I want healthy teeth. I want to be able to eat when I'm 80. 
that allows us to kind of have what I call a North Star to then say, great, you want to keep your teeth healthy. You want to be able to eat when you're 80. You don't want to have pain. What things do you think might you know, help you actually achieve that? And you know, most of the time people start self identifying those things then of, oh yeah, well, I don't brush my teeth. I guess that would probably be one place to start. Um, but without that goal, it kind of feels a little bit disconnected. And so to me, that feels like a really important part of the conversation is to help our patients voice, um, hey, I want to keep my teeth healthy. I'd like to keep them in my mouth, whatever. And certainly you're going to have some patients that are like, I never brush my teeth. I just want dentures, like take them all out, you know, whatever. Great. Okay. Well, we know that this is, you know, you might not be interested in developing, developing these habits right now. And your goal is something different. So I hope that's helpful. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not the, the right answer for every patient. Um, but I do think that if we do it often, uh, at least from my experience, I have had very few, very few times when patients are like, well, yeah, I'd like to keep my teeth healthy, but I'm not willing to do anything to help me get there. What else, Amy? All right, another one came in here and it says, I would like to call my patients, but I'm at home at this point. There are front desk people in the office, but how does that work with HIPAA? How does that work with HIPAA? Um, yeah, so the ADA just released some um, guidance the other day. We can probably, you know, uh, you could certainly find it if you if you just type in ADA uh, teledentistry COVID-19 guidelines. Um, but a lot of the HIPAA guidelines have been relaxed at this point um, with in good faith efforts. And so we're allowed to use things like Zoom or go to meeting or something, FaceTime. There are certain ones you can't use that are public facing, so it can't be like Facebook Live or something. Um, but uh, in you know, knowing that so much has changed, some of those guidelines have been relaxed uh, for the time being. And there are plenty of secure solutions out there that we can start looking into in this time. So that when we do go back to the office and this does become our new normal, when we might actually check in with patients a little bit more via, you know, um, you know, teledentistry or something like that, um, that there are that there are a lot of platforms out there that actually are HIPAA compliant in terms of some of that. So I think Zoom has one as well. Um, you know, that's an addition to the to those kind of standard free one um, that is HIPAA compliant. But there are there are plenty of them out there. So um, yeah, I, I know that if you search that, you can you can certainly find some options. All right, great. Another one here says, like you said, asking what matters. What if it's a conversation where oral health is not even brought up? Like you said, some patients mm -hmm. will discuss work or children or other things. How can you bring up oral health without sounding pushy? Ooh, that's a great question. So somebody said, you know, like, what, <laughs> what matters to you? So, um, you know, I think a couple of things. Um, a, we want to know that information. And so, one of the things that I'll do if a patient starts to bring that up is to say, wow, so it sounds like, you know, taking care of your family right now is super important. Working is super important. Finding a way to, to maintain your job, whatever that might be. Um, how does that fit into your oral health? Um, and so kind of asking that follow-up question can, can help guide the patient to understanding how their values and preferences might fit into their current oral health decisions. Uh, I would say secondly, uh, you know, oftentimes I'll frame it uh, from the beginning in terms of oral health. So, you know, as we think about your oral health, what matters to you? Uh, what's important to you to talk about with me? Uh, and so that kind of guides the patient to not say, well, you know, I'm going to talk to you for half an hour about my hip uh, that I need to get replaced, but I, I want to talk to you about my teeth. And so it's a little bit of both, I think. I mean, I, it's, I want to know what, what my patients are going through. And I think there are things we can do to kind of help guide them in the direction of, hey, this question is specifically related, you know, to oral health. We don't, you know, I, I'm not a, a an orthopedic surgeon. I don't really know a lot about hip replacements. And so while that might be important for my patients to, to tell me, just to know that that's important to them, I, I don't want to dive super deep into that world with them. So I can guide them to, to the conversations that I can support them in and help them with. Great. All right. Another one here says, does MI work better if the patient is already motivated to make a change or is it more effective when you're motivating a patient to create habit change? Uh, say that. Say the beginning of that one again, Haley. I didn't, didn't quite get that. Yeah. Does MI work better if the patient is already motivated to make a change or is it more effective when you're motivating a patient to create habit change? 
That's a great question as well. Um, you know, I, I, yes and. Um, we certainly know that this is not effective in every situation. And it probably opens the door, even in situations where we didn't think a lot of change was possible. So I would say for some patients, uh, you know, when we think about the different pieces of helping patients create change, the last one is, is tends to be planning. Some people are ready, they're motivated enough, they just need help with the planning piece. And so we don't have to do a lot of that building of motivation to help get them to a place where they're ready to make a change. And so we can support them in planning using all these same skills. What do you think you can do? What might work for you? How do you think you might do it? Those kinds of questions. Um, versus somebody who wants to kind of drum up that motivation, those questions might be more, why is this important to you? What goals do you have? Those kinds of questions that are helping the patient talk more about why they might want to make a change. So I think it, it, it's up for us to you know, use our clinical skills to determine where a patient's at in some of that, to kind of understand, wow, this person seems really motivated. They're ready to do it. Um, so if a patient comes into you and says, I've been working really hard to get my baby off the bottle, like I'm trying, I just keep, I haven't been successful, the baby keeps crying, right? Like that patient's probably pretty motivated at that point and we might need to work with that patient on planning versus somebody who's like, yeah, I want my baby's teeth to be healthy, but I don't really know how to do that, right? So we might have to, you know, work, work through some different questions to help the patient understand how they feel about it and why. So it's a yes and I would say for that one. It's a good question, a good question though. All right, couple more here. All right, it says, how do you recommend going about discussing periodontal disease and treatment that is needed? I have replaced a hygienist that worked 10 plus years in this office and did not do probings or clean subgingival at all. And several of the patients I see need some form of deep skills, but they get upset every time I bring it up since the last girl never said anything and they have been coming for regular maintenance. Whew, that's a tough one. How, how do we have that kind of challenging conversation without, um, you know, making the patient feel bad about it, without throwing anyone under the bus? Um, wow, that, that's, that's a really tough one. Um, you know, I think in some of these situations, it, it tends to be helpful to be honest and, but also to just be really compassionate. Um, so in a situation like that, to be like, you know, I'm not exactly sure what's happened in the past, but, you know, what we want to do here is to provide you, you know, what I want to do here is to provide you with the best evidence so you can make decisions and you can make, you know, informed choices about your own health. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure what happened in the past, but I can tell you what's happening right now is that this is what we're seeing. And, you know, then offering the patient options. And so a part of this is not motivation interviewing, it tends more towards shared decision making, but to say, you know, we could continue down the road that you have continued down um, but that might lead to these kinds of problems and whatever down the road. Another option would be to do, you know, the more deep scaling, to do something that is going to address the periodontal issues. That can help this way. You know, here are the negatives of that. It might hurt, you know, whatever. Uh, it maybe costs a little bit more. Um, but ultimately, it's up to you, and you have to decide what's right for you. We're here to help you choose and to figure out what's important to you. And so um, instead of telling the patient, this is the option you need to go down, or this is the option you need to have, uh, you know, I find that patients generally choose, uh, you know, the right thing for them uh, when when we present the options. And so even in a situation like that, you just kind of hold up the different options and say, here's what we could do. You know, I, I, I wasn't here. I, unfortunately, I can't change the past, but we can deal with deal with where we're at in the present and figure out how to move forward. So that's a really hard conversation. I don't think there's a perfect answer. One thing that, you know, sometimes people say to me is like, oh yeah, you know, I hope MI can make my conversation easy. And I think it can make them a little bit easier sometimes, but it's never gonna take a hard conversation and make it easier. It might take a hard conversation and make it a little bit easier, but it's never gonna be like, wow, that was just totally a breeze. And so being prepared for that, being courageous, um, I think is important as well. All right, another one came in and said that, I like how you said in your example, why an eight and not a four? Do you use this in most cases when you are doing yeah, so great question as well. Uh, those scaling questions can be really helpful, and especially once a patient has set a goal. So, you know, in the conversation, Haley, that I had with you, you said, you, you know, hey, leaving my toothbrush out, I think might be important. Um, and so now I kind of want to gauge, you know, how confident you feel with that. We know from evidence that people generally have to be about a seven or above to be successful. Uh, but no matter where they're at, we know it's important for people to talk about why they are confident. So even if Haley said she was a three, I would have said, why are you a three and not a one? 
because I want to know what why she feels at all confident. What is good about Haley that she might, you know, be able to draw from to accomplish this? We might have to have a follow-up conversation if, if she's at a three to say, hey, you know, we find most people, you know, tend to need to be a seven or above to be successful. I wonder maybe, you know, could we go back and look at that goal? Maybe there's ways that we could modify it to help you, you know, feel like you would be more confident. Maybe it's not brushing every night. Maybe it's brushing three times a week if you're not doing it at all. Um, but finding ways to modify that to kind of help the patient feel like, no, this is why I am confident. And so, uh, yeah, but you always want to ask, why are you the number you at and not lower? Uh, which is also why we make the scale from zero to 10. We know from evidence and not one to 10. We know from evidence, very few people are likely to put themselves at a zero. Um, so even if they say a one, we can say, why are you a one and not a zero? So especially after a patient has talked about a goal, I like to use that to kind of determine their confidence. And most of the time, if they are confident, then I'm affirming them, I'm giving them high fives, I'm you know, saying, wow, you seem really committed to this, you seem like you have a really good plan, that's awesome, we're happy to follow up with you. Okay, well, I know it's after time anyway, so you guys probably can't hear me, maybe, maybe afterwards you can hear me, but thank you so much for, for joining us today, it's been, been really a pleasure. Um, I, I really uh, have enjoyed um, being with all of you and, and look forward to answering any questions offline. Thanks, thanks for joining us. And I uh, hope that I get to interact with you um, more soon. Good luck out there with your patients. Stay healthy, stay safe. Appreciate it. Have a great day.